Well, welcome everybody. We have the topic again, um, Laura is really our in-house specialist. She does um, internal work on pelvic floor. And so that is one of her specialties. I do uh, quite a bit of work with people who have pelvic floor dysfunction also, but I don't do the manual work internally. So I will talk about my take on it for today. And then um, I'm gonna let her be the expert, expert, expert and come in September 1st to finish off the conversation for us. But um, do you guys have any specific questions you want answered before I get started? And then I can give you um, some background and some information about what I see and that where there's, yeah, go ahead, Nancy. Um, I had a question. So, you know, in my training for Pilates training, it, it's obviously establishing the pelvic floor connection is important to access TA and really get a strong connection. Um, but it was always described as like just a little gentle lift of the pelvic floor muscle. And when my daughter was going through PT, I, I feel like sometimes maybe that cue, I don't know how to best cue that for people because now it seems as though like with, in my daughter's case, um, she needs to learn to relax her pelvic floor. And so, you know, and I, and again, that's not through Pilates. She doesn't practice Pilates necessarily, but I just, I'm, I'm wondering like, how, how do you, because I feel like it is the ground floor of the core, but how do you cue properly and get people to connect without over having them try doing a full Kegel or, you know what I'm saying? I, that's, hey, that's a great question. Yeah. Okay. Any other great questions or any questions at all? Not great ones too. Stupid ones are good too. They're all good. <laughs> I have so many questions, Dana. Okay. Um, both as a Pilates instructor and as somebody who's gone through physical therapy, internal physical therapy for public floor work. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess what I would love if you have the time is just to take a moment to explain in deeper detail than we normally get in Pilates training about the anatomy and not yeah. just the anatomy, but also like the kinesiology, like what's Clearly the pelvic floor, as Nancy was saying, is kind of like the core of the core. <laughs> but, but one of the things that I'm finding with uh, specifically a client that I have who had a hysterectomy and has a lot of scarring, um, it's like anytime she moves her legs, there's pain in what she describes as her pelvic floor, which may or may not actually be the pelvic floor, right? Um, and then all the fascia and everything else. So as part of um, talking with other people about specific questions around cueing and all that. If we could talk a little bit about the anatomy and also in the movement and the kinesiology as well, just to understand how to cue properly and how much contraction there should be. Yeah. Okay. Be definitely. Helpful. Yeah. And maybe what I'll do is I always like to share anatomy with um, images because I think it's a little bit easier to to understand it, <laughs> if we can see it. So let me just um, get that image up for us and I'll share my screen. And that way we can take a look together and I can explain it. And it, I think it'll make a lot more sense when you guys can see it. So great, any other great question? Let me start by telling you my experience and my background in the pelvic floor and the work that I do with the pelvic floor. Um, and uh, then we can go from there. And so basically, uh, and, and I'll tell you a little bit about my Pilates experience with pelvic floor. So just as a physical therapist and then as Pilates instructor, the pelvic floor work, um, when I first started doing Pilates, right out of PT school, so this is like 2002, there was a lot of talk about the pelvic floor. Oh, do the pelvic floor, you gotta pick up the pelvic floor, hold your pelvic floor. In, in more recent time, I think that we have seen, uh, and there's a great study done, and I should, I should look it up for you and see if I can actually give you the research for the study. Uh, Brent Anderson talks about this. He has a great pelvic floor class, if you guys have taken, know who he is or have taken one of his classes. But he talks about this study in one of his lectures also. And they took a um, group of Pilates instructors actually, and they used an internal un ultrasound and they brought them all into a, uh, into a test, a trial. 
And they put the internal ultrasound in and they asked the Pilates instructors to contract their pelvic floor and let them know when they are contracting their pelvic floor. And it was some crazy percentage. I think it like 70% of the Pilates instructors when they said they were contracting their pelvic floor were actually not contracting their pelvic floor. So it's, that was like, really? Oh my gosh. I kind of want to go do that test and make sure I know what I'm doing when I say I'm contracting my pelvic floor, right? Cause then I'm like, Oh no, maybe I don't even know how to contract my own pelvic floor. Uh, so I think that there's a lot So with the cueing and what do you say to somebody and all of that? I think there's a lot of information there that is a little bit misleading. Um, and so with my PT side, what I tend, what I love to do in my practice and some of the women on this call who work with me know that I like to, I like to trick the body into doing something, even if the brain doesn't know you're doing it. A lot of times I will find positions where I can, I will ask somebody to do an action that forces an issue on the body that they don't even necessarily know that they're doing and then start to bring awareness to it. And so there's one really simple exercise that actually does this for the pelvic floor that I will share with you that most, maybe you guys know it uh, already or know how to cheat a little bit already, but we'll, we can definitely talk about that. Um, I think sometimes our awareness of the pelvic floor and what's happening in the pelvic floor is not accurate. So I think keeping that in mind, uh, you could have the best cueing skills and sometimes it's just not going to be right for uh, somebody with a pelvic, especially somebody with a pelvic floor dysfunction, which is why somebody like Laura, who can actually do the internal work, comes in and can be super helpful uh, at times. So that being said, let me take you back to this anatomy here a little bit. Um, I'm going to just share my screen here. Right. So this one is just showing us some of the muscles that you guys know already. And uh, right here in the front, we're looking at, um, we're looking at, well, maybe you guys know, right? This is psoas coming in, iliacus. So joining at iliopsoas right here. Then we have our adductors, right? So this would be our little pectineus. And then we have the adductor longus and magnus uh, and brevis actually all coming down right from the pubic bone here. So same thing on both sides. They're super important in muscles here to see where they connect right into that pubic area and on this pubic bone. And in here, what I don't have showing is the pubic symphysis. Maybe I can get that to show up for us if I go. Well, you can see it now. I just layered on fascia, but here's the pubic symphysis, right? That big squishy cartilage right in between. And the reason I bring this up is because I just want to make the point that we are not fixed, right? The pelvis is not a fixed structure. There is movement that can happen uh, anterior, posterior, in, in and out, in flares, out flares, right? And, and this is what allows this and then the SI joint in the back. Let me take a layer off here. Are a lot of what allows us to have a baby, for example, right? We, we have to be able to open up in order to have a baby come out. Uh, and so I think in my, well, we have to have a baby come out. Men also have a pubic symphysis because we do have to have some anterior posterior motion of the pelvis to walk properly, to run, right? We need that ability to move. So we needed something there, a structure that had some flexibility to it, not just this whole bony bowl, which we often call that pelvis, the bony bowl, right? And um, if I turn around, Right now we're looking at the back and what you're seeing here, this is the rect uh, the an anus recti, recti anus, um, and it's the sphincter, right? So that's a muscular contraction that we control is the rectal area, which is why I think it gets confusing too uh, if we're picking up the pelvic floor or people sometimes will just squeeze and hold in the rectal area instead of thinking that that's the pelvic floor, right? You've seen that. And I think that often happens with men as well, because they don't have an, like their, their anatomy is so different that they don't have another hole to be thinking about. So if, if they think of squeezing something, that's usually what's going to happen. It's going to be squeezing rectus rather than lifting, which is where, so I would keep that in mind. I, and I'll give you a fun little antic for men 
that um, I asked my husband if that worked for him. And he said, yep, I get it. <laughs> so I, I think it works for most men and, and um, other men really laugh when I give it to them. So it's uh, interesting. I'll give that to you as well. And then if we turn and look underneath, right, right now I'm showing mostly fascia. I'm going to just layer on more musculature here. Okay. So here we have basically that pelvic structure. You can see uh, a lot of the, there, a lot of them are little muscles. And then we have the whole pelvic floor musculature, which would be this here, right? When the idea, when we contract, uh, actually I should turn this around. Um, so, and we can't really see because of the fascia there, but, uh, yeah, let's see. Okay. okay. That's just layering upward. Okay. So now you can see it's kind of a funny view. I know. We've got, I've layered in transverse abdominis. Uh, I've layered, these are the rectus abdominis coming in, which rectus abdominis also attaches to that pubic bone, comes right in, um, that's the linea alba, which is the, right in between the rectus, right, the fascia that comes in as well. So they're all pulling upward on the pelvic floor. The, remember transverse, right, is the sideways fibers. They're pressing down into the gut. So this is where you're getting your whole core. And then we have the pubic muscles around the sphincter and around here inside the bowl that can actually contract and lift. So the, the function is there and we do use it and it does happen, but we just don't always use it in the best way possible, right? So underneath this fascia, maybe I can take the fascia off and you can see the musculature. There's more musculature. There that goes, there we go. Okay, now you can see it. So you can see that it does create this bowl. And why I think it's important to see is because the fiber, muscular fiber direction. And a lot of times when I teach anatomy, I talk about the fiber direction being really important to understand because that is gonna be the direction of contraction, right? So if we have, this is a pretty unique structurally because it's almost circular or half circular structure. So if these fibers start to contract and shorten, the only choice they have is to go upward, right? They're going to shorten and that bowl is going to get smaller or that cup bowl shape that they're making is going to get higher and smaller when those muscles contract. And then when they relax, it's going to settle downward and go lower. So that, that musculature all around in here, the vaginal area, um, inside the vaginal walls, we also have a, all a muscular structure in there. And so when those muscles contract, the vaginal walls, uh, the vaginal area actually gets tighter, smaller. Uh, so that contraction happens in conjunction. I don't think we can isolate that from this bottom of the pelvic floor. I think it all happens at once, but I'd have to ask an expert on that to be sure. But that is my understanding. Uh, is that the contraction happens all at once. So technically, when we're asking someone to contract the pelvic floor, what we are, I think what we're mentally thinking is that lift, right? And that's what we teach in Pilates is that we want to lift up from the pelvic floor as we press down on the abdominal with the abdominals to compress the abdomen and create stability, right? So we're thinking about lifting, pressing in, and then, um, supporting from the backside as well. So we can hold our right spine position, right? We don't want to be moving that spine. So we have, and then we have the diaphragm also lifting at the top of that core, right? If we go through all those areas of the core, the problem, I think we have two twofold. And this is where, and we'll get back, Nancy, I'm going to get back to talking about the two type in a minute. But the problem that happens, uh, and maybe this has happened to you, uh, I had actually a friend of mine who's a physical therapist, who after having children said, oh, I'm going to go get stronger, strengthen my pelvic floor, and I'm going to go try a Pilates class for the first time ever. And so she went to a, a Pilates class at a place that actually is closed now anyway, but she went to a group class and did a great workout. And she said that after it, she actually became incontinent a little bit after the class. So there's two things that go wrong a lot of times with Pilates and pelvic floor. One is that it's very easy, especially in an upper abdominal curl position to bear down, right? Pressing as you're coming up, especially, right? If the focus is abs working, upper ab curl and belly dropping, the 
problem can be that you get pressure downward. And, and so in somebody with a weakened pelvic floor, that could cause an incontinence issue, inability to hold. That's one thing. The other thing is fatigue. In somebody with a com compromised pelvic floor, they, start to they can start to fatigue, which can lead to a loss of con uh, incontinence, um, even sometimes having the organs drop a little bit. This would be really postpartum. It's very common. Um, and so any pressure that's pulling the belly inward or downward can really put pressure on and cause an exacerbation of the existing problem that's there. So, so how do you cue this? We'll get there in a minute. Let me just talk about what then sometimes happens. And this is maybe what's happened um, with your daughter, Nancy. It's very common. The other thing that can happen is that um, after, uh, with dysfunction, with fatigue or people who are hypermobile. So the, the category of people that have pelvic floor dysfunction typically uh, that I've seen are hypermobile, either hypermobile, have had some sort of damage to the area or have, um, or have had children, right? So after birth, even a couple of years after birth, I have women coming in to the clinic with back pain usually. Uh, maybe three, four, five years, or some one of them came in and said, yeah, I had my child nine years ago and I've had incontinence issues ever since or stress incontinence ever since, but I've never really had time or really thought about doing anything about it. I just thought that that's how it is because it's not talked about enough. And um, so when we look at that, what starts to happen sometimes is they've been, they've been stretched out, the ligaments are loose, and then they try to hold, right? To, to stop the issue and the dropping and the incontinence, they start to hold that pelvic floor up, right? They, so they're really pulling up on their pelvic floor a lot of the time. And then the muscles inside get really tight and stressed and contract. And so some people it happens, I've seen it happen on a, in a hypermobile body. I've seen it happen after children a lot of times. Um, and some people then when they get stuck up, they can't urinate anymore. They can't release enough to even go pee pee because everything's so tight and so held up there. And so then we run into this problem in Pilates. So all that to say that the problem that comes up with the queuing in Pilates is first of all, how do we know that they're actually contracting their pelvic floor? And the second one is um, how do we get, be sure that they don't end up stuck afterwards. So that's the challenge. <laughs> I'm going to take my share screen off. And I'm sorry, can I just ask one quick question? Yes. Um, and I had the same question as Nancy, who just asked about the anatomy program, because <laughs> that was an awesome visual. Oh, okay. um, but I missed a, a module by Madeline Black that referred to the pelvic star. Do you uh -huh. know, have you heard that term before? And do you know exactly what that refers to as a pelvic star? I don't know. I haven't, I haven't, um, talked to her about it or seen the, or talked about the pelvic star in that way. Okay. So no, I don't. Um, but I can look and see if I can find it <laughs> and then I can okay, I'll do the same. If I find it, I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah. If you find it, let me know. I'd love to see. I, I love the way Madeline Black puts things together and can, she can really articulate things well. So it'd be a great resource. Um, but yeah, I'd be happy to look at that and see. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. So here, herein lies our problem. First of all, we don't know if they're contracting and then we don't know what we should tell them about so they don't get stuck in a, in a position. So my war the warning signs here are always somebody who, and, and I'm going to stick a little bit with the postpartum family of people, even though this isn't isolated to them, it's just easier to understand, I think, in this context. But a lot of times, um, if they've birthed a child, even if they haven't had a vaginal delivery, right, they're, they've gotten so stretched out and the weight of the baby's been on the pelvic floor for a good period of time. So even without a vaginal delivery, sometimes a lot of pelvic floor dysfunction can happen. So an, a number of things can happen during the birth that actually opens up, tears ligaments, opens up the muscles more, stretches them way out. And as I don't know if, if you guys have had kids or, or if you've seen somebody who's had kids, 
a lot of times even the skin on the tummy doesn't come back the same way, right? The elasticity just isn't quite there after being stretched out or changed to such an extent. So you can imagine that that's likely happening in anybody who's had a, a baby. Um, what we need to do is strengthen everything to hold and help it come back up. But we need to find an awareness about that. And I think, I think cueing the pelvic floor is a good idea, but I think one way that we can help people without having cued it too much is to just, again, force kind of ask their body to do it without them really thinking that that's what their body is doing. So one of the, the main exercises, and I told you I'd tell you this little easy exercise that I have um, that I actually learned from another PT who specializes in pelvic floor. And it's basically uh, laying down in the hook line position. Maybe I should show you. Um, and you put a ball in between the knees. So you're just, they're just laying in that hook line position, the ball's between their knees, and you're basically doing an adductor curl, right? So you're basically having them squeeze the ball. The caveat, so why, why squeeze the ball? Squeezing the ball activates the inner thighs. And if you remember in that image, I showed you all those inner thigh muscles, right? They go right to that pubic region. If you put inner thigh pressure on, it actually activates the pelvic floor without you having to do anything else. So even a gentle squeezing is gonna help activate the pelvic floor already. If you wanted to emphasize that a little bit more, you just turn the feet in a little bit. And I want to say that's because that will help you activate obturator internus a little bit. And obturator internus, if you guys remember the anatomy, the glute anatomy, right? We have piriformis on top, we have uh, the gemelli, which are the twins, right? The small rotators on top and bottom. And underneath all that, we have obturator externus. And then underneath that is obturator internus. Obturator internus is so deep that we really can't get to it from the outside. So I, could, as I could palpate somebody's butt and get into those superficial muscles, more superficial through the glute, even to some of those rotators, but I wouldn't be able to get to obturator internus. The way to get there is actually internally. So that is where another internal therapist can get in and actually release obturator internus if it's holding too tight. So that's sometimes what that therapy has. And I'll let Laura speak to that um, in that, that session when she comes in a little bit more. But um, so we can have uh, inner thighs contracting lightly. If you turn the toes in a little bit, we get a little more contraction. And it doesn't have to be a killer grab because we don't want big muscles kicking in. We don't want coccyx curling or, or pelvic tilting happening. We want that in neutral and we want those inner thighs to press in. So then what I usually do is I put them in that position. I put the ball there. I turn their, I ask them to turn their feet in and then I don't cue the pelvic floor. Then I say, just give a little pressure on that ball. We're gonna go through a whole coccyx curling sequence where I can get pressure on the ball, uh, belly dropping a little bit to get that transverse rolling into that coccyx curl and then coming back to neutral. Um, so you could use that as sort of getting the whole core or you could use just that turned in adductor squeeze, light adductor squeeze um, as an exercise for them. That, that alone is an exercise. I just put a word of caution in. Somebody who's recently had a baby, the pubic bone has probably opened up some. So pressing hard in, so using a ring or something or having them press hard is maybe gonna move that around and make it uncomfortable. It'll make it separate a little bit in that pubic region if they push in hard. So pushing in hard or doing uh, exercises where they really challenge in that pubic area is not a great idea. Um, so as a progression, when everything's going well, doing like side splits on the reformer would be probably fantastic, right, eventually. But that's way down the line, not somebody who's in acute kind of issue with pelvic floor. And then always what I do always now, and this wasn't when I started training for Pilates uh, and physical therapy, we didn't really talk about this as much, but I always ask them to release all the way back down and release the pressure on the ball, right? So you always want to finish with a full release and you don't, and then the other things that I think really help are elevating the hips a little bit. So, I do a lot of work with hips on the roller. Uh, so roller underneath the pelvis across the SI joint. 
And the, here again, there's a lot of reasons that I like to do it. One is that it sort of cheats the pelvic floor upward a little bit, right? So if you're a little bit elevated in the pelvic floor, you're much less likely to bear down. But so you won't have that issue of when I contract my abs, I'm pushing out and down as much if the hips are slightly elevated. You could use, I like the roller. It's, um, it's about, you know, I use the six inch roller. Uh, you could use a wedge or a pillow or a squishy ball, whatever is comfortable for them in that position. And do, you could do some ab work there, legs and tabletop, just light ab work there. Um, and, and also the second thing the roller does is really hold the SI joint stable a little bit. They can feel it if they start wobbling around. So also not only the pubic bone opens, but the SI joint opens a lot when uh, they have, when people have babies or if they're hypermobile, that SI joint's moving around a lot. So this is a great way to also stabilize the SI joint and have them hold steady there. So uh, I can get the hips up. I can work on deep abdominal contraction there. And then I'm always going to have them while they're working, when they rest, everything relaxes back to neutral. And then you start, I usually start working with them um, at, a lot of times I work with Laura in conjunction. So she'll do the internal work and then she'll send them to me for the movement work. And we'll just have a little conversation about what issues she found. Um, if it's a um, issue of holding too tight, then the work is actually learning to release down. So everything has to be in that sort of more neutral position. We're not gonna worry about pelvic floor. Sometimes I even have them open the legs a little bit. So knees opening wide or diamond shape. Uh, diamond positions um, with the legs so that they're not gripping in the pelvic floor, right? So we said that if you squeeze in with the feet turned in, you're activating pelvic floor. If you, the opposite would be true if you wanted to release, right? So getting them out of that inner thigh contraction, letting them relax the legs and then work abs. So for the, for the most part, I think those are sort of the tricks that I use. Um, and the queuing, I don't know if I answered enough of your question about the queuing, if you have more questions on that. Oh, good. Did I totally overwhelm you? You're all silent now. <laughs> That's helpful. Okay. No, it's okay. <laughs> okay. I think Go basically, ahead. I think basically what you're saying is you don't actually don't cue the pelvic floor. You yeah, okay. So to, to, to get them to do that. And then do, at some point, do you ask them or talk to them about that? Yeah, so thank you for doing that. Thank you for asking that question. Uh, so yeah, okay, what happens in, an, in a situation where there is no dysfunction in the pelvic floor or you get to that point where you want them to start building that awareness of the pelvic floor? So with somebody with dis, who's had dysfunction and things seem to be going well, what I usually ask them to do is I ask, I ask them to actually at home in a comfortable, when they're comfortable, um, to insert their fingers inside vaginally and actually feel what's happening. Contract their pelvic floor and actually see if they can give some pressure on their fingers when they're doing that. And I usually ask them to do it lying down first so that they can, lying down is a little easier because of gravity than standing up. The other two tests would be sort of standing up in the shower one is being able to release urine while standing vertically. That's a good test to be able to release and then hold urine while you're vertical. The other would be again in a vertical position or in the shower, perhaps inserting fingers in and actually feeling what's happening um, in the pelvic floor, if they can feel a contraction in there at all in standing. So they start to understand what put together when I, when I feel this way, when I contract this way, I'm actually getting something out of it. And when I'm not, uh, when I'm thinking that I'm contracting, but I'm not feeling it, then I know that I'm, I'm not doing it correctly. And there are, there are some tools, um, there's balls, marbles, and things like that, um, that people use uh, sometimes to, as, as therapy and physical therapy. I have never used them or tried them. So I, I'm going to actually let Laura answer that question about those or how those can be used um, as well. Uh, so there are tools, but I think this is that's a really nice way to see if you really want them to know what they're if what they're feeling associates with what you're asking or what the muscular contraction. It's great to just feel it 
we do that everywhere else. It's just less, it's a little more taboo. You can't do that in the studio, but they can definitely do that as part of their home program there. And then I told you I was going to give you the little, uh, and so what, when do I incorporate it into a person's program? I, I usually go for the ab abdominals first, the deep abdominals first, without worrying too much. If, if they are, in my opinion, and it is an opinion, if they're getting deep abdominal contraction and they're not bearing down or feeling like they're pushing out, which I think you can see a little bit what somebody's doing uh, physically, right? That pushing down, bearing down look, <laughs> feeling the posturing that happens, the contractions that happen, right? If, if they're really able to contract and lift and grow up tall and inside, the belly goes in and everything, their posture lifts, chances are they're not pushing and bearing down. And so I usually, that's how I cue things. And one of my favorite exercises as they, all the people that have worked with me know is taking a ball. I'll show you. I take my squishy ball. Let me see. Sorry, I'm not going to beat you. Okay. And I put it way up high in the inner thighs. Right. And then I ask them uh, a lot of times, I'll use the, the tower or the springboard and have them pull down and put pressure on that ball, but not just in. Have them do a little wrapping pressure and zip up from the inner thighs all the way up through the body. And this is one of my favorite cues, but I actually don't think I ever say lift your pelvic floor. I just tell them to wrap, hold, and lift up from inside. So get that little spiral going so that I'm getting a spiral through the glutes up the inner thighs and zipper up from pubic bone all the way up, right? And I grow taller there. So am I getting pelvic floor? I think so, I hope so, <laughs> but I, it really helps get that lifting when my belly's dropping and getting lifting rather than when, my, when I'm contracting, I'm going down and now I'm pushing down and out, right? Instead, a lot of the cueing that I use is that in and lift up. Um, I do that standing, I love this one in standing. I do, I talk about lengthening a lot um, and hollowing a lot, hollowing through the body. So there's, uh, and, and I talk about my skinny position, right, in a bridge type of position. I love to really cue the belly in, the tail curling. So that's that elevated position, which makes it very hard to bear down. So those are all exercises that I use. But I think, um, to Kim's point, I don't think I cue the pelvic floor all that often uh, in words. And um, so, but I am cueing the pelvic floor. I'm just not asking it in those terms. And then I promised you the cue for men. And I actually am stealing this from, uh, and I forgot her name, this instructor that I saw at a conference one year. And she had the whole room laughing. She's from England, but she was teaching in San Francisco. And she said, okay, so everybody wants to know how you cue men to lift their pelvic floor. And she said, and it's not quite the same as how you would cue a woman for sure. She said, but you guys live right here by San Francisco Bay and the water, if for those who don't know, in San Francisco Bay is always cold, but right? I think 48 degrees Fahrenheit is as hot as it ever gets, that water. So <laughs> it's not, not great. So she said, you just tell those men, you know, guys, you've walked up, you can put your legs in that water, right? So imagine that you're walking in San Francisco Bay water and you're walking and you're wading in and the water's creeping up your legs and it's creeping up your legs and it's creeping and you keep walking in deeper, it's creeping up your legs, it's creeping up and then <gasps> that's your pelvic floor. So <laughs> she, and I was like, that's great. That's genius, you know, because that um, creates that lift uh, that men can have the testicular lift actually that men can have, which helps them activate in that lifting way to the front of the pelvic floor, rather than just squeezing that rectus anus, right? That squeeze uh, in the back, which is not what we want to activate the actual pelvic floor and help lift. So you can take that one or leave it, but I, I stole it, it's not mine, but I thought it was so cute and, and just a fun way to tell a man what to do with the pelvic floor. Um, so yeah, I think any other thoughts or questions or 
I really appreciate you sharing that cue for men. I've actually heard it before as well. And I found that it even, like I've only had a couple men in a class and it's mostly women. And I find that it seems to help them too, um, because it's more visual as to like the differentiation between the two areas of the body. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I just wanted to say thank you for the internally rotated uh, hook line. Cute. That's a nice one. Just for my own, I'm postpartum and I, I did, well, I'm going to add that. Thank you. <laughs> Add it in. Yeah, I think I think it's super helpful. It and it's just gentle, right? We want with the pelvic floor. I think uh, I like to take the approach of treading lightly around the pelvic floor. There's there's so much going on in there, um, and uh, I think just having those little gentle exercises can really create a difference. That doesn't it doesn't have to be a lot of hard work, right? It's it's about holding up the inside, the internal organs. Um, and so I think that is a really useful, helpful exercise. Um, so, and then, so there's one other thing I wanted to tell you on that and it'll come back to me in a minute when I can think about it, but yeah. Um, quick question. What is that anatomy program you had that? Oh learned? yeah, this is, um, it's complete anatomy. It's called complete anatomy in 3d and I use it. I use it actually. Also, I don't know if any of you are teaching courses, but I teach a lot of courses and I use it for those too, because I can create my own slides and put together a whole lecture okay. with the slides that I create. Um, it, it's, it's not expensive to get it. It could be an app or a computer app. Okay. And um, so you, and you can create and save slides and you can use it as an anatomy text. So I use it for the instructor training as the anatomy textbook now, instead of having an actual textbook um for it so it's i think for uh just to use it i think it's only 39 dollars i think to purchase it so it's really reasonably priced i think um that's great i love the layering and like the fascia that's awesome yeah there's all all different layering and then they have prepared slides and things like that too so yesterday i was teaching and somebody asked about trigger finger and i was able to just go pull up a slide on trigger finger which is great because then I, it saves, I don't know, as a teacher, it saves a lot of time and makes it really flexible. So yeah, Complete Anatomy 3D, 3D for Medical is the company, 3D for Medical. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, there was something else I wanted to share with you and I, it's slipping my mind, but I can tell you a little bit about my personal story too, which uh, plays into this pelvic floor issue. Um, so I don't know how many of you have had children or plan on having children, but um, I had I have three. <laughs> yes, yay! <laughs> I think mom's out there. I had three, um, much to the displeasure of my OB, and I'll tell you why. I mean, he he loved kids and he wanted me to have kids, but uh, after my first, so I went into this. I'm I'm pretty athletic. I'm not a superstar athlete, but I everything I do, I love moving and I love being physical, and so um, and I pride myself on my strength. Um, and so this is something that I've always kind of had. I was an aerial acrobat for a while, right? And we always had this competition, pull-up competition. Stuff, so I really like to be a strong person. And so I had my first child in 2005. And he, um, the doctor, he was stuck. He was, during birth, he was stuck. It was long labor. And the doctor was like, okay, I'm going to have to, do something to help you get this baby out. And I'm like, no, 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 I can do it. Like I, as if it was some sort of failure. Anyway, that was a bad choice because I ended up pushing so hard that I actually um, split my SI joint and I pushed my organs out with the baby. So <laughs> not, not great. But um, <laughs> so then um, I had obviously issues after that. And I don't know if any of you have um, ever heard of a pessary ring or seen one, but basically they're silicone rings that you can fold and insert inside. So they actually hold the org your organs up for you when you can't hold your organs up inside. Um, and and I'm, I'm telling you this story because I think these things don't go talk, they're not spoken about. The way that I figured out that, because then after I had him, I thought I'm gonna heal, I'm gonna get better. I, I couldn't walk. I couldn't walk after I had him because the whole SI joint was ruined. And then when I would get up, things would start dropping out. Like, 
And then I felt like, okay, I'm getting stronger. So I didn't go to the doctor right away. I just thought, okay, this is what happens after a baby, right? Not, no, that's not always what happens after a baby, but I just thought, well, nobody said anything, so it should be normal. And I remember my mom was caring for my baby who was now, I think three months old at the time. And I had been doing something else and I came and they, I came home and I realized they weren't there. The stroller was gone. So I'm like, oh, she has them at the park. I'll just go jog down to the park and catch up with them. Well, jog down to the park was not a good thing because I, I couldn't hold, I was incontinent, but I didn't even know that because I hadn't really tried to work out since he was born. And I got down to the park and I was like, this is just wrong. And so I went to the doctor and said, something's really wrong. And um, it was because I had a fantastic nurse practitioner that she was like, yeah, something's really wrong. And I'm glad that you came in. Um, and so I had had that done. I used the pessary. I knew I wanted to have more kids. So I, well, that was it. I was going to use the pessary for a while and try and get stronger and see what I could get. And so then I had a second child. And that process, um, he's, I split open my rectus my rectus split open and I had a hernia. So I had to have that surgically repaired after that child and things got worse, right? So the pelvic floor fell out even more, organs fell out even more. Um, but we still were pretty sure we want to have another kid. And so the doctor said, if you can manage, and if, I, if we do a surgery now, we're going to have to do a cesarean and cut open your abs to get the baby out. Otherwise we're going to ruin the whole surgery that we do to fix your organs and pelvic floor. And so, uh, and they didn't know if I was going to be able to keep my uterus or not, it, depending on how far it prolapsed down. So then I used the pessary again. This time it was pretty miserable. And I have to say it was not a fun scene um, because it was, had to be bigger. It, it was a pretty not fun getting it in and out. So it wasn't a great scene, but I was like, well, family's more important. So we had our third kid. And after that, it was all bets were off all the organs were out. <laughs> so I had to go back to that pessary and then I had to have surgery and where they put everything back in. But then I was pretty dysfunctional, right? It was, it went from being so loose and so out and then so tight and so out. So, and it was a really long, crazy rehab, I have to say. So I just put that out there, but, but now I can run, I can jump on a trampoline, I can chase after my kids, I can do everything that I want to do athletically, I feel great, and I got really lucky because I think I had a really great surgeon um, who put things back together without ever taking out my organs, which was fantastic. Um, so I just put that out there because I think it's such an untouched, it's not talked about enough, and I think in Pilates you get a lot of clients, like I've had I have this one woman who's hypermobile, has never had kids, but super hypermobile, maybe on that Ehlers-Danlos spectrum. And her first session with me, we started talking and I started to get a feel and I asked the question, do you have issues with incontinence ever? And she just started crying right there in the, in the office because she's in her thirties. Um, she's never had kids and she can't, she's like, how did you know? You know, and I said, well, I didn't know. I just knew that you're hypermobile and that you're having some issues and you can't feel your abs. And she had gained a lot of weight and lost it. And so that makes it even harder. Um, and so she just burst into tears. She's like, oh my gosh, nobody's ever even asked me about that. And so I think it's, we're in such a great position to help women who have, who have issues, who could possibly have issues. So if, if you even suspect, I would really encourage you to ask the question, do, do you have, do they have issues with pelvic, have you ever had incontinence issues? Can you run and jump? What happens when you sneeze and cough? Like, can you hold your urine? Um, it's not normal if you can't. And there are things that can be done. Strengthening is one, but if it can't, like in my case, I, my nurse practitioner said to me, she's like, it's incredible because your organs are out, but you're still so strong in there. I'm like, at least something, <laughs> you know, I at least have something. So, um, you know, I think it's, so anyway, I share that because it's been sort of always something that bothered me about my experience. Nobody told me before I had kids that any of this could happen. I found out and I was inquisitive enough and in the medical field. So I felt more comfortable reaching out and talking about it than maybe other people do. So I think ask that question. And I think you guys are in a great position to help 
Um, so, uh, and if you have other questions, I will look up um, Madeline Black and I can send you guys out an email. This is great. Thank you. You're very welcome. If I can make it first, I'll be there. <laughs> okay, awesome. Well, great to have you all as usual. And um, I will look forward to seeing you soon.